and we are live welcome to one stop co-op shop this is steve and i'm here with barrett steve hi how's it going man it's good to be here thank you for inviting me on always always welcome so welcome to co-op chat where we are it's a weekly chat where we talk about uh new games coming out and cooperative ones specifically and we have a discussion topic so the discussion topic today because we have barrent obviously obviously has to be around dungeon crawlers right <laughs> it does steve and dungeon crawlers are amazing i like them. we're gonna talk about them yep so we talk about like what we think makes a good dungeon crawler like what aspect we look for in those and stuff like that so stick around for that but first let's talk about some new games new game stuff okay first one i want to talk about is a game that's coming up on pre-order i have not heard about this yet um but it's antoine bowser's bowser's making it old tree is the name of it so it should be up on pre-order soon um it sounds i mean i like antoine, antoine bowser stuff but it's a, there's a fully co-op of course and you're knights in the fallen kingdom and you try and protect it and it sounds like it has scenarios but it's not necessarily hey you have to do a a or a campaign for this you can just play each scenario independently so i don't have a lot of information on this one but you know anything that's uh antoine bowser cooperative and kind of like a venture type style type game um yeah i'm interested so that's old tree the other one i'm gonna talk about for news is the a long extended party is coming out with a new expansion called Ald Aldberg Plot. If you're not familiar with what a long extended party is, so Lord of the Rings, the living card game, is one of my top games of all time, and it has since stopped producing official content for it. However, because the fan base is amazing, they are making their own content for it. And honestly, this content looks like super professional. Like, I look at the cards, and they look like legit cards that the fancy flight game would produce uh, with awesome mechanics stuff like that so that is out now you can get a new expansion and uh, colin has been playing with this new content on the one stops channel so if you're curious about it you can check it out there the other thing for news this came up just the other day is one of my favorite games and my favorite stealth game for sure uh, v commandos is no longer going to be called V Commandos. It is now going to be called V Sabotage. You might be asking why. <laughs> well, why is because unfortunately, some uh, Triton Noir, the publisher, received a letter from a video game company of some nature that said that gave him a cease and desist for using that name. So unfortunately, they're going to have to change the name of their product, but luckily, it's just the name. Um, I assume they have to do something about some of the cards because the cards, the names. Of the games on the back of the cards like the event deck but other than that that stuff i i don't think anything else is changing so but yes so v sabotage is gonna be the name going forward so that is like the generic news stuff i have this week uh for kickstarters coming out this week if you're curious about any crowdfunding games um i only have one to talk about and this one though is a pretty big one and that is soul raiders so this is coming Kickstarter on July 7th. And this is a, it's a, it's a fantasy, I kind of want to say more of an adventure type game where you are exploring the world in something that reminds me of a seventh content type type stuff where you have these cards and you can choose what actions you do on the cards to, to find another card and like link this whole, whole world together. The interesting thing about this is it is very much card driven. So the cards will say, um, is, is your research resources you have for it. So there's like no, no luck in that sense. Um, it's just like, Hey, do I want to spend my resources on walking or unlocking the door or whatever it is versus other things to do. But yeah, that's coming out and we do have a video coming out on the channel for that. Mike is covering that one. I'm going to yeah. throw you a curveball here, Steve. Oh, ready? go ahead. So Steve and I were kind of talking about kind of the stuff we're going to do for the news. And I'm throwing a curveball here because I'm going to talk about a Kickstarter that he doesn't even know I'm going to talk about. <laughs> well, great. Don't even have prepared. Actually, <laughs> what you got? I've got one called uh, Valor and Villainy. I don't know if you've seen this. I think originally it was a competitive game. And they're back on Kickstarter with a cooperative version of the adventure game. It's supposed to be, they label it as a kind of quirky little fit dungeony 
crawly type campaign game now for heroes and stuff. It says here that it's in this campaign, heroes can progress a hilarious narrative, making fateful de- face of oh, that fact. If I can read here, fateful decisions which unbox hidden content and create memorable stories. So that is on Kickstarter right now as well. I'm just thinking about that as you were pulling up yours. I'm like, I'm going to throw a curveball because I remember I looked into this one. I'm, I'm thinking about this one. So I thought other people yeah. want to know about it. Yeah, that one I mentioned last week. Um, oh, did you? It, it, yeah, no, no, you're good. You're good. But like, um, that was kind of, a, it's got this quirky humor to it. So I'm not sure about, yeah. I got, I can look into it because I think there's like something about pizzas in it or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, it looks interesting, but it also looks a little bit like it, it, it actually kind of flows into what we're going to talk about, because that's something you want in your dungeon crawlers, quirky weirdness. Oh, you know what? That's perfect transition. It's like you can do, do any better. So, yeah, that's all the news we have. Um, I'm sure we're talking about more, more stuff um, for sure, because uh, and speaking of old last week's uh, uh, Kickstarter stuff, I am I did play Velocity Vanguard last night. I want to play some more before sharing my thoughts of it, but uh, that was like a big old space battle game that's uh, got a lot of solo and cooperative elements to it. But um, I'll probably share my thoughts on that uh, soon after I get like a couple more plays in. But at least so far, I'm really enjoying the the core of the game. It's pretty fun. Okay. Nice. Let's talk about Dungeon Crawlers, because I'm sure that's what people are here for. (laughs) Bet. Like I said, oh, just because we're doing this live, if you want to drop in your own thoughts and what, what... characteristics you look for in a dungeon crawler you want to say hey you guys are wrong this is what we should talk about drop in youtube comments we're watching them we'll respond this is this is the fun part of the, the show right yes it is all right so let's start with um one one thing that i think we both agree on is is ai for for me i <laughs> like having a very good engaging ai in games and i i think the some of the the best examples of that um, are twofold. Um, Soul and Sorcery and Medara have amazing AIs in them. They're so good. And mm-hmm. I say the AI, 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 AI is something I want because for me, a dungeon crawl in a board game sense, is a lot of it is basically trying to replicate what you experience in D&D, an RPG, right? And yeah. you want to have that that thing where the things you're fighting against feel alive. And having something that's intricate in what they're going to do makes it really, really fun. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to do that when it has to be run by somebody that's not a person. And so it's really kind of, there's really two different ways you can do AI. One is like you're talking about Sword and Sword from Madara, where I consider it a static AI. It has like a rule system kind of, and you're kind of puzzling out the best way to kind of take on a villain or a bad guy. Or you've got the opposite approach, which would be a very... Uh, Gloomhaven style or even Shadow Brimstone where it's technically a random style where you're kind of putting your cards out there or, or I, and cards being just a metaphor you're putting yourself out there to, with your plan and hoping it comes to fruition where in Sword and Sorcery and Madara you've got your plan you can kind of see what's going to happen of course there's with them it's the dice that's going to be a random element right. that's going to be like is my plan going to work we'll find out and so that's two different approaches and two different ways that people probably are going to enjoy a dungeon crawler comes to an AI system. At least that's just me. No, I agree. I agree. Hey, uh, good morning, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. So, but yeah, no, I, I agree. I think the AI ha- has to be engaging and at least for the games, um, specifically so and sorcery and Madara, because uh, we were talking about a little bit right before we started was, um, the difference between a, a known prescripted, AI functionality versus something unknown like in Gloomhaven, right? If it's something mm-hmm. in Madara or Sword and Sorcery, you kind of you know what they're going to do based upon your position and what other elements are on the board, and so that becomes part of the puzzle. Um, so yeah. something like Gloomhaven, it's fun because you don't know what they're going to do, so you kind of like, well, I kind of have an idea of what they're going to do, but if you played the, right. the the game the characters before, um, but it so you try to you try to guess it based upon your previous knowledge, but you, it's not part of the the puzzle necessarily because it's not a known feature. I mean, they both have their pros and cons. I don't think either one's necessarily yeah. superior to the not other. It's just one, what... yeah, there's, never a, there's never one that's right or wrong. I've just, right. personally, I have a harder time with the random one unless there's something you can do to kind of at least counteract the randomness a little bit. Uh, sure. I've, I'm not a fan of running up with my brute and being like, all right, I played my two cards. They're going to be like attack six and attack four. Here we go. And they pull their card, block six, retaliate four. Really? All right, well, yeah. now I have a dead turn. And dead turns in dungeon crawlers are killers. So 
trying to eliminate that dead turn is something else you have to kind of think of when you're talking about dungeon crawlers. And I've noticed the more that we're progressing in the genre, you're eliminating a lot of that dead turn issue. Um, some of the earlier ones had some of those dead turns occasionally where, for example, Shadows of Brimstone, everything is random. And sadly, you could have a dead turn because you roll a one on your movement die. And you're like, all right, I move one. And then I keep my grit to roll again. I got another one. Well, I'm out of the battle for a time. We'll have to wait till I get there. And so you got your dead turn. And But that's that's a whole other <laughs> topic in almost every game. There's a lot of this in other games, too. Where dead turns are, so, are terrible. Nobody likes them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Avoid those dead, dead turns. Yeah, that's a... I mean, that's just good good to avoid no matter what topic we're talking about. But yeah, absolutely. Right. Dungeon Crawls, too, for sure. Um, yeah, and I think the one thing that I I remember Gloomhaven... Well, Gloomy and Social Sword and Sorcery do this. I think Madara do too, does it too, where even if you quote unquote miss, you still affect the board. You still change things because a lot of times in those games, if you have a negative effect like poison or knockback or something like that, that will happen regardless if you do any damage per, per se. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good way of getting around it, getting around that, hey, I try attacking and my attack just missed. Like, and that, this is something yeah. that I've played in D and D before. Where like, oh, cool! I'm running up to this big bad guy. I'm gonna swing my sword, roll my dice, and I missed. And that's all that happens. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like, but you, and again, that kind of acts, I think, as you move forward, because then you get like character progression, where you get in, for Dungeon Dragons, you get two attacks, three attacks, like this. Exactly. But in Sword and Sorcery or any other dungeon crawler, they're gonna start looking towards helping you mitigate that issue by giving you more abilities or more turns or more things you can do. So. And every dungeon crawler does that a little bit differently. Some send you down certain paths, like sort of uh, shells of brimstone. You kind of start. You can kind of go down a path on your character that kind of increases mm -hmm. their like powers and abilities. Um, sword and sorcery. Every character kind of has their little deck of stuff you can get, and that's based on alignment. So that's how you're. And some of them, well, some are generic ones. And of course, you've got the behemoth of all. You got Madara, where it gives you a stack of cards about this big, and you can kind of create your guy whoever you want, which. To me, is a fantastic system. But again, you got your pros and cons on that. Pros and cons. This is a little overwhelming for a lot of people. <laughs> Which one do I take? And also, with this many cards, there's a chance that you could min-max this game and potentially find a combination that could break a system. Um, there were a few out there, and I think Succubus Publishing went through and kind of ratted a lot. Not necessarily ratted. They actually reprinted a lot of the entire card pool to counteract a lot of the people that were finding broken combos and people are still going to find them in a system like that where in sure. sword and sorcery you get like here's your stack of cards you get you can maybe choose about three or four on your first uh, and then you're moving to level two and then that's your new power that you can get which helps people when they're not sure what to do in a dungeon crawler for sure for sure yeah and, and that uh, getting to that point like just calling out specifically is character progression has to has to be in a dungeon mm -hmm. crawler from some level right yeah and Agreed. I think that's that can be twofold. Like what you're talking about now is the the powers of the character, and I I think that I, I agree is a very strong aspect to it. Like especially Madar. Madar is by far the best example of character progression because, like you said, it has a huge stack of cards. I know when we were playing it, I got overwhelmed. Like holy cow, I can do all these things. <laughs> Which ones do I want? And I had to like just like okay, I'm gonna ignore this style because I know it's probably not my style. I'm there's probably some cool combos in there. I can. But I'm just going to worry about this thing, right? Uh, but yeah, I love, 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 love that open open nature of like how to build a character. Make it your own is really, really fun. Because I think that's what makes the character progression so fun because we all have our own play styles. We all like to do certain things in the game. Like, hey, you know who likes to play support? <laughs> you know, so like I like having some type of support abilities in there and maybe someone else like, you know what, I don't care. I wanna I wanna smash some skulls in, right? And let me get some some dual hammers and crush things, right? So that is the power aspect, right? But I think the other way you can do character progression is with loot. And you have to have loot in the dungeon crawls, I believe, because like I mean I've I've done RPGs, I've GM'd uh game mastered RPGs before, and happens all the time hey we killed that dude let's go loot his body I'm like oh well let's you find some money or you find his weapon cool i'm gonna take it right that that is innate in like a lot of people who play this game and i think it comes a lot from video games right video games do a yeah. loot system in major ways and having that loot system where if it has interesting items like i think someone short does an excellent job with this where 
these items almost are act like other powers you can leverage and utilize. And now that adds to the combos and intricate ways you can build your character. It makes it really, really fun. Yeah, this is true. Um, and whether or not it's a loot that's just giving you a bonus to a stat or versus being able to give you better attacking or defending powers. Yeah, definitely. I think that helps. It helps create a character and helps you build a character that you might be interested in. Oh, I found this giant axe. Well, I'm not going to use it. Do you want to use it? Yeah, I'd love to. And right. most games have to get through a certain mission. You can usually re-equip characters and do what you want, which then people can start making the kind of characters they want, For which sure. is a good thing. Um, I know in Madara, because we're talking all the kind of the bigger ones, um, their loot system is, is a little, you don't, I mean, I we played all the way through Act 1, and we really didn't come across them as like, they have the loot deck, and very rarely are you pulling a loot card that gives you something that you're, like an item or something, but it does happen. Most of the time it's all Monday-based, and then you just come to a shop phase, where then they lay out, again, everything for you. And you can buy anything you want. And again, it could be a little overwhelming. But if you know what kind of style you're doing, it kind of helps. Where things like Shadows of Brimstone thing, you're randomly drawing a card. And you're hoping, right. again, you've got that randomness. You're hoping for something. Which feels very reminiscent of something like you're saying. If you're making trying to get a role-playing game onto the table. It was always very like, oh, I'm going to roll on the magic item table and see what we get. Versus, all right, when you kill this monster, you get a Vorpal weapon. Oh, cool. Yep, so exactly. it, it's cool to make characters that way. So we do have a question coming in. Kevin has a Ooh. question. He says, uh, what about Valor and Villainy? Do you consider it as a dungeon crawler? Does it have a different system that might be of interest? It's That's that's a great question. What do I consider dungeon we, we, You know, Steve and I had been struggling with this almost all week. We've been going back yeah. and forth, back and forth. What is a dungeon crawler? And you're hearing us talking about Sword and Sorcery, Madara, uh, Shadows of Brimstone, Gloomhaven, because those are kind of your classic dungeon crawlers. People know those games. Um, we were discussing where do you draw the line? Is right. Nemesis a dungeon crawler? Technically, you have a board. You have people moving around a board, randomly finding places um, with an objective, and resources are slowly being drained while you're trying to complete this objective. Is that a dungeon crawler? Because once you complete the objective, you've beaten the, quote, dungeon of Nemesis. Right. But where else where where do we draw that line now for me nemesis isn't a dungeon crawler i call it a survival adventure game because you're what you're lacking is your overarching story which is another thing i think you need in dungeon crawlers is something that's keeping you moving through this through this world um madara has a 425 page ruler or storybook <laughs> where sword and sorcery has just kind of a small little book of secrets and some little flavor text before each dungeon which is enough for, and then you got Gloomhaven, which has this, what people consider its fault. It doesn't really have a cohesive story. It doesn't have anything like that, but we still categorize it as a dungeon crawler. So we, we, we could, we, we could keep talking about all these different games, but where do you draw the line? Is this, which one is it? Uh, Valor and Villainy. Valor and Villainy. Yep. Yep. Honestly, yes, it could. You're moving around a, an exploring a, a map, a, and your resources are being drained as you're trying to complete an objective. May it be go to a place, find something, or kill something. So, yes, you could categorize it as have an overarching story. This one sounds like it has a campaign going on. So, but are, is, is there character progression? This is another thing we think of in a dungeon crawler, I guess. I mean, so, yeah, I guess you could call it that. But, again, where do you draw the line? I mean, Nemesis, of course, doesn't have character progression, really. But it does if you're talking about a loot system. So... <laughs> <laughs> it also it, it's really it it's a hard it's a hard line to draw because then you got yeah. adventure games that fall in the same category sometimes too which kind of go up and down. I mean, we were talking about Mage Knight. We don't consider that dungeon crawler. We consider it an adventure game. But again, right. your character's progressing. You're kind of creating your story as this board unfolds around you. So it's it it's it's a hard one to swallow. So we're kind of just lumping the bigger ones together. So it's hard to that, I don't know if that's going to answer your question. It's probably the most roundabout way of me telling you. <laughs> We don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess I need to. I need to look at Valor and Villain a little bit more. But like, I. I mean, it gets weird with like, what is a dungeon crawl? Like to throw another wrench in the plans because we're playing it on the stream channel. Um, in fact, Monday. Uh, uh Reichbusters, right? That one has an mm -hmm. overarching story. That one you have loot. That yep. one you have leveling up. But you are mm -hmm. moving stealthily through a Weird War Two setting. Like, so it's not like. The yep. fantasy trope tends to be attached to dungeon crawlers very strongly, while other other themes don't necessarily. But yeah, um, I don't yeah. know what system in Valor and Villainy would make it stand out to the other ones. I think I'll have to get back to you, Kevin, on that one. We do have another yeah. question coming in from Johnny. 
Johnny says, seems like Aisa's vanguard would be a dungeon crawler because of the overarching story. With loot and explanation. Um, yeah. yeah so I mean, I, that's a good question. That one's hard because one, we, and we don't have the game out yet. That's one of the hard right. parts. Right. Um, where it stood from the last time I heard about it, I would have categorized it more as an adventure game. That's what I would lean towards but as well. I know, I, and you know a lot more about this game than I do. I have kind of, I, I don't, I haven't been keeping up with the messages on that one. I'm excited for the game. Don't get me wrong. I'm really excited <laughs> when this game comes out. But I know you've been keeping more up on this one than I have. Uh, maybe, but like, I guess just to lay, lay the cards out a little bit. For me, a dungeon crawler is combat focused. Very much combat focused. When we start talking about games that have non-combat options and has more of a world you can go out and explore, technically that now branches into adventure game for me. That's how I, I approach it. Right, A dungeon crawl is very localized. Here is a dungeon. Here is a map. Here is a, a, a locale. Going through this killing monster game loot. Right, It's all about combat game loot and leveling up. As opposed to adventure game, which is like, I could go to this country, this part of the world, this part of the world. I can talk to people. I don't have to fight. You know, to me, that gets into the adventure category a little bit more. Um, but yeah, um, Isis Vanguard, I maybe? I don't know. That's a good question. And then Johnny has another follow-up question. Do you think Dungeon Crawler should be just fantasy and dungeons and not other settings? Mm. This no, one, it I, should be any setting you can get. That, I agree. If you, can, if you can do it, do it. I think that's fantastic. Um, for example, you've got Cthulhu Death May Die could technically be a dungeon crawler. It's a one-shot dungeon crawler, but it's a one-shot dungeon crawler in the Cthulhu world. Um, I've got an Aliens uh, Glorious Day in the Core. I consider that a dungeon crawler. Your character's on a map fighting through these aliens to try to complete an objective, and your resources are being slowly drained to, before, and hoping you can get to this place before you die. Um, that's a dungeon crawler set in the Aliens universe. Uh, I even got the Aliens 1986 version somewhere. I'm here somewhere, trust me. That I game's have amazing. It. <laughs> my favorite game, one of my favorite games. It might be on my dungeon crawler list when I make my video. Um, the that again is a dungeon crawler. Yes, if you can get it in in uh, in a world, fantastic. Um, what was Sword and Sorcery had that Galactic? Which one did Sword and Sorcery originally have? Galac um, Galaxy Defenders, I think it was. Yes, thank you. Another type of dungeon crawler in a sci-fi world. So no, it should not just be fantasy. You, I think fantasy is strongly tied to what a dungeon crawler is because there are so many in that genre. But yeah, anywhere, man. Super yeah. Cool. And it to tie that back to our, our topic, right? What makes a good dungeon crawler? And I, I think it does not include theme. I think you can have a good dungeon crawler regardless of what the theme is, right? Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. has has those elements we're talking about with the overarching story, character progression, loot system, and good AI is what we've covered so far. Yeah, um, in our chat. Um, the Ghost Betwixt actually does it in a modern time, and I think it's oh, I'm yes. super excited for that, and that that's got a really cool system. Um, that is going to be, I'm pretty excited to get into once it gets in my hands. I had the, the production copy at one point, but I had to pass it on. Now I'm just waiting for my copy. Yep. Yep. There's one other characteristic we haven't talked about that I do think makes for a good dungeon crawler that a lot of games don't necessarily do, but I think this sets, sets them aside from your, your standard fare. And that is ability to affect the game in, in, in the future. So like, uh, if I were to go to the town and I decide to like burn down a, a building, right, or whatever it is, you know, and then oh, by the way, that building's no longer there in the future games, right? Or if I made the decision that hey, I interact with this this character in a certain way, and now he's part of our party now, he he follows me along, like being able to have that sense of interacting with it, um, and it gets a little bit into the venture category because then you kind of look into like outside the dungeon, but like having a little bit of that in that game, it really sets it apart. It makes the world kind of feel alive if you can right. make that in a dungeon crawler. It it's a tough thing to do because the farther you give people decisions to affect a game, the more you have to put in. Hey, is this guy still alive? And when you're moving forward in a dungeon, because of course, it, there's not a person directing you like a dungeon master or a game master. There is these cards or a story book behind it that's like, hey, do you have? George in the party. No, I don't have George in the party. Okay, go to number 163. Okay, then so now it almost becomes a choose or adventure the more you throw these in there. But if you can do it inside just one flat dungeon, like you're kind of talking about, and then maybe that affects the town in the future. Like, oh, hey, we got the blacksmith out, so now this opens up whenever you go to town. And that gives right. you the ability to have blacksmith ability. 
So I, that's a way of, like you said, making the game come alive and making this whole, getting it more into a world feel, which then you say, again, crossing into that adventure category, but you're always <laughs> moving back into the dungeon after you do talk to the blacksmith. Exactly. Exactly. So Kevin has his own characteristics he wants to share with us. He says, sure. I like the wound system in Valor and Villainy, where if you don't have a high number to defeat a monster, you can spend some to wound them so they become easier to defeat. Yeah, um, yeah I agree with that. I, I, uh, This game does not get enough, well, I know on One Stop Co-op Shop Discord, we a lot of love it, but uh, Dungeon, uh, Dungeon Crawler with a different theme, I would probably say, it, well, kind of, is Gears of War. Like, it doesn't really have the loot system exactly. You do get better weapons if the things drop, but you don't have character progression at all in that game. But the one thing it does really well is is the wound system of that game, where you have just a few states of health. You have, like, full health enemies, wounded enemies, and dead enemies, right? And being able to spend resources to try and knock them down past those, those thresholds to to change this, the to your limited enemies is really, really fun. And the other one, um, I was going to say, is... Oh, Reichbusters. Reichbusters does an excellent job where basically all the enemies in the game have one wound. You just have to deal one mm -hmm. wound. But you have to overcome this defense value. And you could do yeah. that by rolling dice and being lucky like Barrett. <laughs> or actually probably... Or unlucky. <laughs> unlucky. Yeah, your rolls have not been the greatest on the stream... On the, no, uh, the videos it's lately. really bad lately. Really bad. <laughs> but, uh, but in Reichbusters, you can spend cards to give you results or even more dice. And so... You can dump your whole hand and like make sure you, you kill this guy because you get over that threshold, which is really, really fun. Not to mention you have other ways of doing it. So, But yes, it's a great one, Kevin. Um, having some resources where you can mitigate any luck in the game to to destroy enemies, for sure. I kind of think that's another thing that in, in any game, I think that's important to have is some kind of mitigation. Um, one thing that I enjoy in Dungeon Crawlers that has just recently come into the fold is the concept of failing forward. I think that's becoming huge. I don't like to replay scenarios. I don't like to play scenarios just because it, things went badly. I, I will play a scenario again if it's because there's something that I kind of can plan for or it's something that they were that they were kind of having a plan that you would probably fail the first time. Because like, oh, you come, like you're doing this, you're doing that. Oh, you pulled the lever, this happened. And then, oh, you're good in here. And the boss is like 20% more health. It's like, Oh, really? And then I have to try to overcome this. Oh, man, we totally just failed. Okay, but that's okay. We know not to press that lever again. Okay, let's go get him this right. time kind of thing. Right. I would, if that's the case, I'm okay with it. I'm still not happy about it. I've gotten to the point now that I, <laughs> I would like to play the game and I'd like to see what happens. I don't, but I would like to not be automatically like, oh, you failed. That's okay. We'll just go forward with the story. No, I want it to have a consequence. And so I love the idea of failing forward with a consequence, which is starting to become more and more in these dungeon crawlers. Um, your older games really didn't have that, um, except I guess Shadows of Brimstone did. They would have, if you failed, this would happen. A lot of times it would devastate the town or you would have something detrimental happen to your characters and you could continue forward. Where in Madar, if you fail forward, you go potentially to different readings or different, or even play a different scenario based on something that may have happened to you. You could even lose one of your main characters in Madara and have to bring in a new character because you failed so many times. Where in Gloomhaven, you fail, their idea of failing forward is, well, that's okay. Why don't you come back? There's nine other scenarios you can do. Come on back later. <laughs> There's a few scenarios in that game. <laughs> just a few. Yeah, and if, that's, and if that was their idea, that's fine. It, I yeah. just, I'm not a fan of redoing a scenario. Where kind of like with, uh, uh, if, I know you talk about right Brothers, you fail, you got to do it again. If you want to see, if you want to see, if you're able to, but of course, there's a random element in the enemies you fight in that game. So it does make it a little bit different right. instead of just the static sword and sorcery. On the other hand, you fail, you usually do it again. And yes, the enemies come out randomly, but usually near the beginning, there's not very many enemies come out anyway. You're just fighting spiders or gremlins over and over again. Then you're like, really? What are you talking about? We don't do that a lot it's on the stream channel. <laughs> <laughs> As we failed, I think we've lost our past five <laughs> games of that. You are amazing, Steve. I would have probably <laughs> thrown the game in the garbage by now if I had to redo that mission over and over and over and over. <laughs> well, to be fair, we are trying to, like, uh, we're, we're playing with the new stuff in the old setting with new, all these, everything mixed in. Yeah. And I think it's just, like, super hard because, like, people were complaining the game is too mm -hmm. easy. And now it is super hard. And, and to be fair, we made a mistake last game where, yeah, it's fine. Our healer's dead. 
But during Ghost Form, thinking he was in Ghost Form, which is true. But um, we waited too long to resurrect him. <laughs> so that's on us. <laughs> so... <laughs> Dead he- healer is always a bad idea. That's just the theory. Um, anyway, but, but no. uh, you actually do bring up a good point when it comes to the difficulty of a game. Um, mm-hmm. You do want a dungeon crawler to be difficult enough to challenge you, but yes. not difficult enough to make it feel hopeless. That's and so I know that's a fine line. And that I think is one of, I would say one of the hardest things as a creator of a designer of a game to be able to do when you have a game that is supposed to have multiple scenarios with character progression and you're supposed to try to create something that challenges them every time they sit at that table as they go through it. That has to be an unbelievable task to do because you never know where that person sits. Sword and Sorcery is a good example because you give a person that's died every mission and then they're just going to get wiped out once they get to like mission four or something because they have no abilities. Where you have the person that's stomped on everything so far and has made it all the way there and now it's just a stomp fest. It's just right. there's nothing. There's no right. difficulty. So it, it's really tough. I think the way to counteract that is kind of how um, I want to say is it I, I know Madara doesn't. I know a lot of other games do it. You don't get a lot of rewards for what you're doing in the dungeon. You get them post dungeon. So they're kind of at least able to set a limit. For example, in Madara, you've completed this one. You gain one experience point instead of a random amount of treasure and experience coming through that can totally alter where you are in Mm -hmm. your power level in a game which i think is kind of important um it it's a really fine line and it's a real hard one to i think master as a creator um that's just me i don't make games i just play them (laughs) right right yeah and i I think the nice thing is with a game like uh, gloomhaven you've got so many levers to pull so Mm -hmm. even if you progress forward um and you finding it too hard you can you can change you can keep the same scenario but just make it easier because you can do all these things to to help in that sense and i I think that's a really smart decision what they did there yeah um i know other games done crawls do do struggle with that a little bit more and that's that's actually part of the problem getting back to our sword and sorcery plays that we're doing on the stream channel is because we're substituting enemies in there so it's already being more challenging right and so to make it easier honestly i just have to substitute different enemies in and and that would Mm. help a lot um, but you're getting to another point that I think is worth talking about, uh, for dungeon crawlers is the problem with progression, progression. And, and that is at some point, if you are doing well, you get more, better rewards, which means you do better, you get better rewards, right? And it's kind of like almost a, a, a snowball effect in a lot of, a lot of games. Same thing with losing, right? If you lose, well, now the enemies are stronger because the, the game is expecting you to be stronger. Well, you're not. Now you're losing more, right? And it becomes a snowball effect the other way. So it's very, very hard with when you have progression to find that nice balance in the game. And so I honestly think you have to have levers for the for the players to pull to make it so that if you do run into that situation, you're not stuck. Yeah. You you have a way of getting out and making it the right balance for your, your uh, players. Yeah. And of course, this game is your game. Have fun right. with it. Make it fun for you. Don't think like I have to play completely. I mean, when you see me recording a game or doing something, I am playing with every rule. I am playing with everything exactly how it's made. But when you're playing this game, you're not recording it. Enjoy the game. Enjoy what you want to get out of a game. Don't feel like, oh, wait, wait, we have to do it this way. This is so hard. How are we ever going to do it? I Never do that. Always make it your game. Make it fun to be or play and have a great time with it. I know Madara when it when you're talking about this progression system again they have actually an interesting way of doing this if you're doing poorly in scenarios and you're not doing well instead of being rewarded with experience you're rewarded with gold there's like a point where it's like hey do you have how many experience points do you have three four five well if you have five experience we're going to give you 10 gold if you have three experience we're giving you 100 gold now go buy some now shop and train so they're counterbalancing the concept of not getting the ability is by being able to get some equipment and loot that will help you in the next. So they kind of keep it. I've noticed that that's their way of kind of keeping your character progression across the board to be able to, because their monsters don't scale. They just every, they have the whole static environment where right. this is your, this is your board for this dungeon crawler. Try to get through it. Your puzzles in front of you kind of thing. There's not a lot of randomness to it. Right. For sure. Uh, Johnny has a comment here. He says a uh, dice throne adventures. When you lose the dungeon, you still get loot and extra healing potions for the next try of the same dungeon. So you become stronger with extra healing for the next try, which is a, a I think it's a pretty good way of doing it, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes it so that every time you lose it, you're going to have better, better chances of finally winning it. So if you are going to replay the game, 
I think that's a, I think it's a good solution. That's a great solution. I don't like replaying stuff. Yeah, I've got too many games back here to have to play a scenario four times to get through it. <laughs> so, oh, oh, getting back to your previous comment, by the way, Baron, if you want to yeah. see accurate plays, watch Baron's channel for sure. If you want to see, <laughs> I don't know, with all the subtitles at the bottom. <laughs> with subtitles, yes, yes. <laughs> but if you want, Forgot want to, see people... to roll this dice. <laughs> If you want to see people doing non standard ways of playing, I, I can help with that end. I don't. We on our stream channel, we tend to uh, explore games a little bit. Let's put it that way. I like. I love my house rules. So that that's awesome. Yep. Yep. I, okay. Kevin's got another comment. Uh, yes. he's, oh, sorry. Uh, no. Kevin says, uh, per, "But progression is part of what makes dungeon crawler fun." I would not have it any other way. Otherwise, I feel like each scenario can be played as a one shot, which is not the same. I Agreed. Agree. I agree. Hundred percent agree. I want character progression. I do like the fact that there are games that give you the ability to one shots. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Some people enjoy that. I do not. I want to live the story. I want to live the experience of. I want to live my characters' lives, yes. which is another, which is another interesting topic where um, some dungeon crawlers. Uh, really give you this feeling of these are your characters you learn about them you experience their them through these dungeon crawlers and you kind of live out that whole exciting experience with them which is great and some have just kind of the generic fighter all right here's your right. fighter he's gonna go through the thing but i like having more of like this is the person this is the character this is who it is but of course then you lose kind of the ability of being able to name a character and kind of so it i really like having the ability of knowing who this is going through the dungeon does that make sense is that kind of weird no, no, I, I I think you're right there. Um, I I know it's nice to be able to have that one shot if you want to try it out. Um, I know someone sorcery what they do is they say, hey, by the way, if you're gonna play a one shot, uh, you start with these many powers, this much money, um, and and so you kind of start off at a level, right, and you go from there. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's not what makes it fun. What makes it fun is, like you said. This is my character. I went through these trials and tribulations. I found yes. this loot, and I. And this is now what we've. This is now my character. It's not not necessarily the end result. It's the journey along the way that makes it fun, right? Yeah. Now, I there's one thing coming out in Sword and Sorcery which I'm very excited for, and I think is an awesome idea for Dungeon Crawlers is they're making a arena uh, oh. expansion. So you could take a character that you've been playing in Dungeon Crawl, and you know what? Maybe it's like you know what, guys, uh, the t the rest of the players can't meet up. I want to play my character. Let's just throw him in an arena and kill some bad guys, right? I mean, I mean, you've got your character sure. built. You just grab him out of the box and play. I mean, I think that's a really cool concept, and I think that's something that would be really fun in a lot of these games to get that standalone uh, nature. Yeah, which uh, kind of talks about the concept. Another thing that's kind of we like in Dungeon Crawlers are as your resources are drained, not to you get to objective, but you get that boss fight. That's awesome. Um, and every hoping every dungeon crawler comes to this. I know Shadow of Brimstone really does boss battles well. They you almost every one of them ends in a boss battle or a giant battle of some kind. It's always like you have to get to this and your resources again are being drained. Your characters are slowly getting wounded. You're barely got anything left and you flip over the tile and also there's a little, little flippy coin thing and it's got the exclamation point in your line. Finally, we got to the bad, the ending here. It's like okay, now draw an epic level event. It's like. Oh boy, and all of a sudden you got the big giant, like, huge statue come out, or the big dragon comes on the board. You're like, my guys are so hurt. I don't think we're going to do this. <laughs> and it's so much fun to see that come on the board, and you have to try to really take this guy down. And it's super fun to do it. Uh, Gloom, uh, Madara gives boss battles, but not in every everything. But once you, I've talked to many people that have gotten to the first boss battle in that game. And when they, I, especially a hungry gamer, I was talking to him, William, um, and he, got to the point where he got to that final, the first big boss battle. He said he put on the board, read what it was and walked away. He walked <laughs> away from the board because he's like, I don't know what to do about this guy at all. As he had walked away and had to think about kind of, how am I going to do this? This is guys impressive. And so it was, it's really cool to get to that boss and have that feeling like, Oh yeah. my gosh, what am I going to do about this? Yeah. And then having, and then you then see what you can do. That's a fun thing. You get that in dungeon crawlers. I think that's a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree. And like the someone sorcery bosses, you don't get to them too often, but every once when you come across them, and like each of them feels very different and they have their own own way of they're going to play and you have to figure out how to hit their weak spots with what characters you have so it's like this puzzle like crap i if i knew about this guy i might have i might need some flying i need some range to protect this guy he's going to lot he can drop down these shadows and flames and it's just really fun to try to figure that out mm -hmm. uh, we have some other comments from here um kevin has another one let's just talk about one shot this is deliverance mm -hmm. has a pretty good skirmish mode do you yes. consider this one 
has a as a dungeon crawler. Um, oh wait, do you consider this one has a dungeon crawler? Has there is also, I think oh. you meant to say, do you consider this yeah, a dungeon crawler? There's also has a campaign. Yeah, um, it is a skirmish run right now. As it sits right now, it's what I've played. It is not a dungeon crawler. Um, I but I'm hoping that campaign really brings that feel. Um, and what it sounds like, it will. I know that not everything's available to the beginning, so you're going to start at a lower level. You're going to, as you're fighting through, you're going to see this. But again, I don't know the board concept and kind of what they, if it's very similar to what you're doing now, it really, to me, would be more of a tactical skirmish game with uh, character progression and things. Very similar to kind of what Wild Ascent is doing right now, right. where you have, it's more of a ta uh, skirmish game on the board, but then it has that, like, adventure character progression city progression type thing outside of that board so that wouldn't and if you haven't noticed we haven't talked about kingdom death we haven't talked about wild ascent we haven't talked about any of these these are boss battlers i would say are skirmish games so mm -hmm. those aren't ones i'd put into dungeon crawlers so where this game sits right now i'm not sure i'd categorize a dungeon crawler i'd move it as tactical skirmish game with a lot of character stuff coming up inside of it yep and Kevin also says, yeah, boss battles are fun as long as they don't feel like a powered-up normal monster. I want them to feel unique. I completely agree with you on that one. And I do mm -hmm. think that's one that I, for Sword and Sorcery definitely stands out for me. Um, I think Madara does too, as well. You would consider that one. Um, yeah, definitely agree with there. Um, another comment from Ra Raphael. Um, it says, Arena of the Contest was the other way around. Began as, began as an arena skirmish game, but the dungeon crawler part was so good that they expanded it with Tanaris. So that one I'm this not as familiar with. Group. Oh, Colin and I will be playing that game when it comes out. We were a Ooh. big fan of this one actually hit. We played through the first, I think, one. I think we played through the first three dungeon crawls. I think the next thing we were going to do was fight a dragon. And we decided to stop it there because that was when they were doing their Kickstarter. And we're like, let's hold this game. This is a lot of fun. Let's wait till that Kickstarter hits because they are going to, they're really, like he said, bringing this into the dungeon crawler era more than it is an arena game anymore. They're going to still obviously keep that as part of their game, but uh, yeah, we're excited for this one. This one was a lot of fun when we played it together. We didn't do it. I don't think we didn't do any recordings of it. I think we just got together and played it a few times and we really enjoyed it. And cool. we're coming when that one comes out, you will see that on both of our channels without any problem. Awesome. I look forward to that one. Yes. Well, we've been chatting for a while. You guys have been awesome on the, on the YouTube comment section. I think we've captured all the questions so far. Um, I, don't think we had any other topics. Do you have anything else, Garrett? Um, let me look at my list here, Steve. No, I think we covered it all. I mean, the only thing we didn't cover is how important is story to you, but I think we kind of covered it as we were going through talking I about it so. in general. I really think the story is part of the one of the main things that separates dungeon crawlers from a lot of the other games. Like when you're talking again about uh, any of these other, like uh, you're talking about other games that have maybe a similar feel. I think the story really separates a dungeon crawler from any other type of one-shot type things. Okay. Kevin has one more comment. He just came in here. It says, uh, I think the board and deliverance seems pretty much static. So there doesn't seem to be any exploration in there. Pretty sure exploration yeah. is part of what defines a dungeon crawler. Agreed. That's yeah. that. Yeah. So that's why I think it's going to be remaining a stat. I think it would be more of a skirmish, uh, miniature skirmish game. Yeah. Um, like I said, very similar to Wild Ascent. Um, and I think you're going to see the progression and stuff outside of, and the story and the campaign is going to keep that game exciting for me. For sure. Sure. I agree. Cool. Well, we've been going on. Normally, this, I target this for about half an hour, but we went on longer because you guys were awesome in YouTube comments. We'll just, we'll just keep going yes, while you guys it. are going. Uh, but yeah, I had a lot of fun with you, Baron. This was a great topic. I really enjoyed our discussion. I hope you guys enjoyed it, too. Yes, it's, a, it's a, always time. fun to talk to you, Steve. I like Dundercrawlers. I could probably talk to him about it for another you hour. Do and a half. I never knew that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, uh, I've been uh, I've been pressured by a few people of that one stop co op shop. I'm probably going to be coming out with a top dungeon crawler list very soon. So stay tuned Ooh. for that. Look forward to that one. <laughs> Madara might be in it. Just heads up somewhere. I I suspect yes yes. Cool. Well, thanks, guys, for hanging out with us. Um, thanks, Baron, as always, and we'll do uh, another of these next week. I don't know what the co topic's going to be yet, but we'll uh, for sure announce that when we get closer. But, yeah, thanks everyone for watching, and we'll see you at the next stop. Bye. Bye-bye.